Good morning. Uh, welcome again to the Challenge of God conference. Uh, this is our third and I regret to say final day because the first two have been uh, quite wonderful. Um, my name is Hugh Miller and I am one of the uh, co-organizers of the conference. And uh, I would like to repeat some of the things that uh, my fellow organizer, uh, Colby, said yesterday. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank, um, in, in the highest possible way, uh, the Hank Center for Catholic Intellectual Heritage for <coughs> its uh, generous funding of this conference, for its providing uh, so much of the logistical resources to run it, organizing the facilities, the, the site, the, every, the, the meals, the everything. Uh, and the general cat herding apparatus that is always necessary uh, to, to a large conference, which is filled with people who are thinking about other things than organization and logistics, uh, presumably much more important things. Um, and, uh, and especially, I would like to thank the graduate students um, in the philosophy and theology department who have devoted um, hours uh, uh, uncountable to the organization of the conference, building web pages, building template pages, running, setting up a registration site, um, handling a thousand and one details that go into a complex operation like this so that it, it runs uh, like a, a well-oiled machine. Uh, we are in such uh, good, good shape and such good hands. Hire them when, when they get out. Just hire them. <laughs> they, um, they're really good, um, and they will, they will, they will be right. Um, now, um, I, I'm, I'm charged with saying a few words to sort of, sort of, sort of introduce the day and, and proleptically think about the end of the conference. Uh, we've had uh, several really absolutely, in fact, all of the plenary sessions have been really quite wonderful, beginning with Robin Horner's splendid, splendid piece of ancient spirituality. Philosophy. Um, yesterday with Adrian Peberzak and with Richard Carney uh, and with Sean Peberzak. And then today, two of the people who are seated, seated here will be presenting plenaries, um, uh, Dr. Altizer and Dr. Kudo. Uh, I think that, uh, it, I think it's part of you know, what Heidegger, Heidegger would call the gestell, the framing of our current scene, that technologically we, we, we come to think that these kinds of person-to-person, -person, in the same room, face-to-face -face meetings and discussions uh, can be mediated by any means whatsoever, whether it's a text or a Skype or a Google Hangouts or something like that. But uh, I, I, think that's, I think that's wrong. And I think that there is still immense value to all of us getting together and listening to and thinking through with Face to face, viva voce, and people who have a lot to say, whether they're young scholars or, in the case of Professor Altizer, um, veteran scholars of the long <laughs> um, and, and from, a, from a, a widely diverse and often conflicting range of positions in this area. And I certainly think we've gotten, a, gotten that at this conference, and we'll get more to come. So I want to thank everyone who has made the great effort of making the trek to get here. Some of you have come from very far away. <coughs> Our first plenary speaker, uh, Dr. Warner, came from Melbourne. Uh, and it's, that's, that's a long haul. So, um, but it, it, we, we're all the great beneficiaries and the great, uh, uh, we, we profit greatly from that, that enterprise, that effort that you put in to be here and, and to, be, to be present without, as Jean would say, uh, tenaciously and persistently and insistently occupying the present uh, and guarding against anyone coming in. Rather, this has been a conference where, where people have been welcome to And it will continue to be so until the very end. So, um, our first speaker this morning will be Professor Altizer, but to introduce him, I would like uh, the moderator of the panel, Professor Caputo, uh, to give us a few words to um, uh, to, to place Professor Altizer in a context of whom he was one of the, the inceptors 15 years ago. So, thank you very much. Thank you. 
Good morning. Um, it's great uh, honor and a great pleasure to introduce uh, <coughs> Professor T.J.J. Altais to you. One, one of those J's is Samuel Jackson, if I'm not mistaken, right? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when the history of this uh, of, of, uh, era, era of American theology is written, there will be a chapter on the work that uh, Tommy Altizer and others have done that captured the popular name, The Death of God. The timing of this conference is absolutely felicitous. You have no idea how utterly felicitous the timing is. Fifty years and eight days ago, on April the 8th, uh, 1966, Time Magazine published uh, its Easter issue, its Holy Week issue, on cover, said, Is God Dead? Black cover, red letters, Is God Dead? And um, it uh, crystallized and, and, and energized a uh, sensational cultural theological event. Um, called Death of God Theology, of which uh, Tom was the uh, centerpiece, I think, and certainly the most long-lived and healthy of all the God. <laughs> he is giving God a good run, actually, <laughs> for, just, for permanence of presences. <laughs> and... Um, Along with some other people you probably haven't heard of, who, oh, well, Harvey Cox is part of this one. Uh, and other people here, William Hamilton, and, uh, Paul Van Buren, and, and uh, Gabriel Bahain, and some others. So, what I'm going to do is take just a couple of minutes. Oh, and, 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 and what, what Tom was at that, that time a young, young assistant professor, he was, I mean, this really was a cultural event. This was TV night talk shows, the whole thing, stuff that. Uh, none of us uh, are likely to ever see. I mean, this, this was serious national uh, theological discourse going on in, in public. Um, and um, Tom was just a young assistant professor in those days. He uh, was at the <coughs> university uh, for about 12 years and got quite a lot of ugly uh, uh, hate mail. And uh, Emory University got quite a lot of heat for what they were doing, and, uh, but stood by him. And uh, then he moved on to uh, Stony Brook to a long and distinguished career where he taught religion and uh, theology. Um, and uh, his involvement in literature during those years at Stony Brook is part of what we're going to be hearing about today. Now let me just give you, the, since, since we've been doing the saturated phenomena for the last couple of days, you may, might, might not quite get what death of God theology is. So let me just give you a two minute encapsulation of what is happening, what, what this means, and what the context of what Tom's going to talk about uh, this morning. Uh, Tom, by the way, I should say, that this part of the normal introduction, uh, has his both his BA, his BA, MA, and PhD from the University of Chicago. He worked under uh, Joachim Bach, who wrote a dissertation on Carl Jung, got to be uh, friends with and collaborated with Mercia Eliade. Um, and is one of the preeminent American theologians of our day. So that's the sort of standard thing you're supposed to hear. Death of God. What, what Altizer and, and uh, this, no, what, what Tom Altizer uh, thinks is a kind of apocalyptic theology uh, in which there is, uh, and by apocalyptic he means a process of creative. I'm, I'm going to presume to speak for you here. A process of creative destruction. Okay? That is an apocalyptical destructive clearing that clears the way for a creative uh, uh, eruption. Um, so it is um, it's, it's, a, it's a creative negation. It's a total transformation. Um, does, so we're, you're not thinking in, in, with this kind of apocalyptical theology, you don't think in terms of incremental changes. You, th you think of theragone total transformations from total absence to total presence, from, from, uh, from nothing to something. Uh, 
Um, so, phil so philosophically, it's, it's, you, you think in terms of being <coughs> in terms of presence and absence. Politically, you think in terms of revolutionary change, not incremental change. Uh, personal, in personal and ethical terms, you think in terms of conversion from, from sin to grace. In eschatological terms, you think in terms of heaven and hell. And then, in strictly theological terms, crucifixion and resurrection. And that is not simply an instance of what he's talking about, it's what he's talking about. And the story goes like this. You might think in terms of two deaths of God. The first, the original, the primordial death of God, is a radical understanding of Jesus as an apocalyptic preacher announcing the end time, the end of the history as we know it, and uh, its transformation into the kingdom of God, now meaning the death of the transcendent other, holy other, alien, God, who at a certain point is indistinguishable from the evil one, enacted in the death of Jesus, who is emptied into the world. God the Father is emptied without remainder into the world. Transformation, the crucifixion, resurrection, but the resurrection is the worldly enactment of what was, what's going on in the name of God. That death was, which, which is the truth of early, the early Christian primitive spirit, primitive Christianity, on this, on this account, was reversed. And by, by a counter uh, revolution, a counter apocalyptic, which established, re established the transcendence of God again. And that's called Christianity. The history of Christianity, the history of uh, uh, the heavenly sphere and the earthly sphere and the eternal one coming down and taking human form, and then going up again back into heaven, and the reestablishment of that two worlds uh, transcendence, imminence, neoplatonic schema, is the counter-revolution, counter-apocalyptic, anti-apocalypse. So that we are waiting now not for the coming of Jesus again, but we're waiting for the new crucifixion. They were waiting for a second crucifixion or a second death of God to recover the primordial original death of God. <coughs> that takes place in, on two, in two places. First in philosophy and the other in uh, the, the great epic in literature. In philosophy, it's, it's announced in Hegel, in Hegel's reading of the old Lutheran hymn, The Death of God is Dead, and in Nietzsche, in the history of nihilism, which culminates in the death of God, where the trick is to read Hegel and Nietzsche together. So you've got the history of the saving of the spirit in Hegel, and the history of the, of the evaporation of the spirit, the becoming nothing of the spirit in Nietzsche. Keep them together. That's what's, that, so, the, so the recovery, rediscovery of the death of God took place in, takes place in philosophy in those two figures. But it also takes place in literature. In great <coughs> epic apocalyptic poets. Epic poets. Of which there are two kinds. Protestant and Catholic. Blake and Milton on the Protestant side, 
Dante and James Joyce on the Catholic side. So the revival, or the recovery, I shouldn't say revival, the recovery and rediscovery of the death of God has a Protestant form. It takes the form of radical Protestantism. And it also takes the form of radical Catholicism. And we, the conveners of the conference has, have invited Tom here to talk about what he calls radical Catholicism, as embodied in the figures of Blake and Andrews. I'm sorry, Dante Andrews. Let's welcome Tom and Tom. Includes, as he very rightly said, both Catholic and Protestant expressions. And one of the things I was hoping to encounter here, but I don't know whether it's here or not, is a contemporary radical Catholicism. And um, that's something that I'm committed to, but I'm not a Catholic. I'm aspiring to be a Catholic, but uh, frankly, I'm one of those who's damned, so I don't expect to make it. But <laughs> I am committed to what I identify as the Christian epic tradition. And this has deeply Protestant and deeply Catholic expressions, of course. But today I'm going to, excuse me, oh. <laughs> Today I'm going to be primarily concerned with James Joyce. And I think there is no greater challenge than attempting to understand Joyce theologically. Now, I'm persuaded that he is profoundly Catholic, but this is a radical Catholicism, but you should be aware that radical Catholicism is already inaugurated by Dante. And one of the challenges here is attempting to apprehend a genuine continuity between Dante and Joyce. Now, somewhere, <laughs> I don't know I should have prepared better than I did. At any rate, I am committed to a scripture that enacts it itself as the opposite of scripture, which concretely, of course, occurs in Joyce. But you should be aware that this is already manifest or already real in Dante. Now, for some reason, most people are close to the heterodox Dante. Uh, he wasn't condemned by the papacy for nothing. He was condemned for a very fundamental reason, and this is very interesting, I think. But uh, at any rate, I'm uh, committed to a heresy, and a radical ultimate heresy that evolves out of orthodoxy itself. Now, we already see this in Dante, and then it's overwhelmingly real in Joyce. So it is that a deep and radical heresy here evolves out of a pure orthodoxy, and nothing else is more manifest in the evolution of the Christian epic imagination than its movement from orthodoxy to heresy. Yet this heresy is truly the dialectical other of orthodoxy, ever more fully realizing itself 
as a new scripture, a new embodiment of an absolute light and an absolute darkness. Luther revolutionized Christianity by rediscovering the crucified God. This is the deepest of all renewals of Paul, just as it is inseparable from, uh, oh, I'm sorry, <coughs> an ultimate realization of the totality of guilt. An absolute guilt revealing the necessity of the crucified God, apart from whom eternal death is our only possible destiny. Now, I want to confess that I've been obsessed with damnation all of my theological life. And for some reason, uh, that seems to be unique, which frankly surprises me. I, I don't see how you can be a, a genuine theologian without a deep sense of damnation. So too, Heidegger discovered an apocalyptic aridness, uh, thus making possible his deep move beyond Dasein, and by moving to that new apocalyptic ground, Heidegger made possible a revolutionary transformation of philosophy, one truly renewing the apocalyptic thinking of Schelling, Hegel, and Nietzsche. Heidegger is the deepest of all philosophical influences upon late modern theology. And if this resulted in a phenomenological bracketing of God, by necessity, this could only be a temporary suspension or epoche, but one making possible an ultimate theological revolution. Now, I am committed to this theological revolution, which is so purely embodied in Hegel and Nietzsche, and which I think actually renews a long lost Christianity centering upon the dawning of the kingdom of God. We now know that Christian orthodoxy arose as a transformation of an original Christian apocalypse. A transformation which is the most radical and total transformation in the history of religions. And this is a transformation that the Christian epic ever more decisively and more comprehensively reverses as a truly new apocalypticism dawns in Dante, bursts forth ever more deeply and comprehensively in Milton, and then seemingly becomes total in Blake's revolutionary vision. Therein, we can truly see a comprehensive evolution of heterodoxy. And this is a heterodoxy renewing an original Christian apocalypse. And one of the things that sort of fascinated me is the way in which the young Heidegger became so profoundly committed to a recovery and a renewal of the original gospel. And, and this seems very strange to people, but uh, I, I think it's very exciting. At any rate, the uh, Christian epic, which actually revolves about a renewal of the Bible, and the renewal of a lost Bible. It, uh, nevertheless, is a return to a fully apocalyptic ground of original Christianity. Even as uh, Ulysses and Finnegan wait must be interpreted as reversed, or inverted apocalypses, they are apocalypses nonetheless, and apocalypses fulfilling a Christian epic tradition. 
a tradition which had ever more fully inverted or reversed everything which the Christian tradition had known as apocalypse. Yet it is precisely thereby that an original Christian apocalypse is renewed. And if nothing has been more deeply repressed in Christianity than its original ground, nothing has been more alien to our dominant Christian traditions than that original brain, that original apocalypse, which itself is one of the most revolutionary movements in history. The Christian epic, or the Christian epic visionaries, are all renewers of the original Jesus. And I'm fascinated that a great philosophy, philosopher like Heidegger could have been so committed to a renewal of original Christianity, which makes possible a whole new philosophy and new theology. Now, we should understand that there is such a thing as a radical reformation a radical reformation which is profoundly embodied in paradise lost. And then it realizes its purest expressions in Blake's Milton and Jerusalem. This is an apocalyptic tradition unknown to our theologian, whom Heidegger already reveals as being alienated from, the, from an original Christianity. Now, this is an apocalyptic tradition unknown to our theologians, and inevitably so, if only because theology is so alienated from the biblical apocalypse or biblical apocalypticism. Now, one of the ironies here, and this to me is a bit of uh, embodied in Thomas Schweitzer, that uh, some of the most radical thinking, as it were, actually revolves about an attempted recovery of Jesus, an attempted recovery of a long lost Christianity. And I'm intrigued that so much of our ultimately radical vision revolves about an attempted recovery of the original gospel. And one thing I have to realize here is this overwhelming sense in this tradition that that original gospel has been absolutely reversed and absolutely inverted. And it takes a truly revolutionary movement to recover that original Christian apocalypse. Now, this is an apocalypse that is reborn in the Christian epic. Nothing is more startling in Joyce's vision than the deep and comprehensive presence of the apocalyptic Jesus, a Jesus that had been absolutely uh, transformed by the Christian tradition. And I think it's fascinating that if we can identify Joyce as our most radical or revolutionary uh, modern uh, visionary, it's so fascinating to discover how much this revolves about a quest for the original Jesus. And one of the things you learn here is how profoundly that Jesus has been transformed by the Christian tradition. Now I think it's fascinating that of all people, Heidegger gave himself so profoundly to an attempted recovery of that original Jesus. And that recovery is only possible 
as a truly radical or revolutionary quest. Now, Paul could know the church as the body of Christ, a body which is the embodiment of the crucifixion, and only thereby the eschatological Adam. But Joyce can know the world itself as the body of here comes everybody and on Liva Lydia Plurigo. This body too is the body of crucifixion. And only thereby is it an apocalyptic body. And just as ALP and HCE are polar expressions of one body, that body is an apocalyptic body and an apocalyptic body which is totality itself. And it's so ironic that uh, so many people identify modern visions of totality as an absolute heterodox. But it's a he heterodoxy that's an attempting to recover an original Christianity. Now, this is a truly new expression of that totality which Blake finally knows as Jerusalem. And just as Blake's Jerusalem is the totality of the apocalyptic Jesus. Joyce's total body is the apocalyptic Jesus, but now an apocalyptic Jesus who is holy and anonymous Jesus. But nevertheless, Jesus, if only because this is a truly crucified body. And a crucified body that is not only the crucified Jesus, but the crucified God. Nothing is more revealing about Christian theology than its deep inability to know the crucified Jesus as the crucified God. But all too significantly, this is an ever enlarging motif in the Christian epic tradition. And just as Milton's Arianism derived most deeply from his refusal to recognize the impossibility of the crucifixion of God, Blake's Christianization or Christocentrism ultimately centers upon the crucified God. And here, Joyce is deeply Blake. But Joyce finally envisioned the crucifixion as the Eucharist of the universe. Here we have some profoundly Catholic vision, but it's a radical Catholic vision, as this is a universe which is realized in the apocalyptic sacrifice of God. Here, Joyce is in deep continuity with Dante, as he himself realized. And there is no fuller literary presence in Finnegan's Wake than the Commedia of Dante. And Joyce and Dante alone, among our great visionaries, finally come to know the universe itself as the body, or volume, to use Dante's word, the paradisio, the volume of God. Joyce envisions this body as a Eucharistic body, as the Missa Solemnus is ultimately transposed into the Missa Jubilaya. And just as Finnegan's Wake is our most comprehensively liturgical work, thereby being in deep continuity with Ulysses. Joyce and Dante are our deepest Catholic visionaries, even if this is an alien to the great body of Catholic theology. Joyce and Dante are our deepest Catholic visionaries, even if Joyce's Catholicism is a 
totally reverse or inverted Catholicism, but thereby, if only thereby, it is in genuine continuity with Dante's Catholic vision. The Easter celebration of Book Four of the Wake uh, opens with that Sanctus that is the great prayer of consecration in the canon of the Mass. Sanja, 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 here chanted in Sanskrit, because East and West are now one. An elusive motif of the wake is now decoded. And this is the Augustinian phrase, securus judicat orbis terrarum, that converted John Henry Newman. And this phrase, in various transpositions, appears again and again in the wake, offering yet another Catholic ground of Joyce's vision and one that is not fully called for theologically until the creation of this epic. This is the theological ground stating both the nature and the identity of true Catholic authority. The judgment of the world as a whole is the true authority. And now, Securus Judicat becomes Securus Jubilandi as an external and exterior authority passes into a universal Misa Jubilaya, or the no say of the Catholic and Christian God passes into an absolute yes say, an absolute yes saying which is absolute joy. This is a joy that Dante alone among our visionaries had known before Joyce. And it is a joy that is a, reco a recovery of the long hidden Beatitudes of Jesus. Beatitudes which pass into the brute actuality of the world in this era and do so even in its ultimate blasphemy, the blasphemy which is here an ecstatic celebration, and even an ecstatic celebration of the apocalypse, the Eucharistic and the crucified body of Jesus as occurring between pages 377 and 380 of the way. I urge you to read those absolute words. And this is very, very deeply held, even if it's alien in the majority of Catholic theologians. This very section culminates with the first pages of the wake to be written, 380 to 382. And these center in the crucifixion of God, or the crucifixion of H, C, H, E, or here comes everybody, eliciting the anguished cry, I have a terrible, terrible lot to do today, to do today, to do today. These early pages eventually became the conclusion of Book 2, Chapter 3 which is both the central or axial chapter of the way and also the most difficult and complex section of this dream or night epic. And there is only one full and actual movement throughout this section, the movement of crucifixion an eternal death which is not only the center of an historically cosmic Holy Week, but which is reenacted again and again throughout both Ulysses and Phineas Wake. 
Well, everything is the same in this eternal recurrence or return. It is the same anew. And the mystery repeats itself to date. For now, the primordial mystery becomes an apocalyptic mystery and a mystery even now being unveiled. And not only unveiled, but cosmically enacted and enacted in that universal Eucharistic body, which is the primordial and apocalyptic sacrifice of God. The church knows the apocalyptic sacrifice of God only in the Eucharist. And just as the primal action of the Eucharist is the anamnesis or renewal of the crucifixion, and anamnesis, which is a renewal of primordial sacrifice itself. The major action of the wake is the anamnesis of an absolute sacrifice, which is ultimately the sacrifice of God. One here beginning with the fall of God or Satan on its first page and culminating with that resurrection, which is the resurrection of the crucified God. Yet this is the resurrection of Anna Livia Plurabel, who is Dante's Beatricia reborn. And just as Dante envisioned Beatricia as the incarnate body of Christ, Joyce envisions Anna is that Theotokos, or mother of God, who is the mother of the universe. But now, a mother who is embodied in the brute actuality of matter itself. As matter and spirit wholly pass into each other. And at one prefigured in the Nissa Solemnus, and finally embodied in the Musa Jubilati. Now the deep power of the mass passes into the power of the world, or the body itself. And this is a body which is a cosmic and historical body simultaneously. A body which is a new universal humanity and precisely thereby a universal body, a universal Eucharistic body. Body embodying a universal sacrifice, a universal sacrifice which is the sacrifice of the crucified God. And a universal sacrifice which is the deepest and most comprehensive action Joyce's apocalyptic epics. An action which dawned in Homer's epics and dawned even earlier than this in Israel's epic sagas. Epic sagas which Christians know as prefigurations of the Gospels. And sagas which become universal sagas in the Christian Epic, above all other genres, is inevitably given to a universal horizon. And just as epic is our least understood literary genre, it is theologically the most baffling genre as well. But a deep and comprehensive theology is fully present in all of our great Christian epics and present here as present nowhere else. Yes, this is certainly a heretical theology and is already one in Dante. And if that theology becomes totally heretical in Blake and Joyce, it is no less theology because of that. And in Joyce and Blake, it becomes our 
total theology. The truth is that all of our great Christian epic visionaries are far more deeply theological than are our theologians. Perhaps this is the source of the deepest hermeneutical barriers which their language embodies. And if here, cosmos, humanity, and deity are united, this is a unity unknown to all of our philosophers and theologians. And this is a unity which surely speaks in the language of Ulysses and Finnegan's way. <coughs> but so likewise does it speak in the language of the comedia and in the language of Paradise Lost and Blake's, Milton, and Jerusalem. There is a power in this language which can be discovered nowhere else. A power which is clearly the power of scripture, one embodying an authority which is simply undeniable, but an authority which is a truly cryptic authority, and while such an authority may well be embodied in all genuinely epic language, this is another point at which epic is truly opaque to us. Could the authority of epic language derive from its very universality, the most universal expressions which we have been given? And if a genuinely epic language is truly universal in its own world, did our modern epic arise from a new universal world and a universal world which is truly and actually a comprehensive world? Genuinely epic language is extraordinarily difficult, posing deep problems for its reader unknown in any other genre. And even as our great epic writers have been creators of language, a genuine sign of the true epic is that its revolutionary transformations are absorbed by the language which follows it. As is clearly true, not only of Homer and Dante, <coughs> but in our own time of Joyce too. And Joyce, who is surely the greatest creator of language in the 20th century. All of us are Joycians now, whether we know it or not. And are Joycians in our language, or are so when we actually speak. So likewise, were the classical Greeks Homerians. And Joyce consciously intended to create an Homeric epic for his own world. Yet this linguistic genius never learned Greek, just as he never learned Hebrew, and yet he created epics which are classical and biblical simultaneously. And that can be said no other writer since Milton. Milton consciously knew himself to be a prophet, as he declares in the opening of Paradise Lost. And he created a vision of the fall that has become more widely known than that of Genesis itself. Indeed, yep. Oh, Innumerable people read the beginning of Genesis as though it had been written by Milton himself. And this is just the effect which true epic has. And as it absorbs and transforms that scripture which is its source. 
yet thereby scripture becomes even more fully, even more comprehensively scripture itself. And just as something like this occurs in every genuine religious tradition in the world, it also occurs in our imaginative traditions. But in epi, the imaginative and the religious or the sacred are truly united. Only the Christian ethic, however, is truly universal. Only here are the sacred, the cosmic, the political, the psychological, and the conceptual realms truly united. And even when an absolute void or nothingness is called for, as it is in all of our Christian epics, this void is intimately related to if united, if not united with its opposite or contrary. And when it does triumph, as in Blake and Joyce, it calls for not a simple nihilism, but a pure or a pure serve, but rather a reverse or inverted language, and one inverting not only logic and grammar, but syntax of its own language as it becomes a universal language. Well, this language clearly negates the language that precedes it. This is a negation which is an affirmation. And an affirmation incorporating into itself that language and horizon which it negates. So it is that the Christian ethic is an ethic of joy and affirmation. Here it has no real precedent in the ancient world. Yet, perhaps it is most joyous when it is most negative, when it most fully negates its own world and tradition, when it becomes a genuine scripture in the fullest sense. All of our great epic poets are revolutionaries. And not only imaginative and religious revolutionaries, but political and social revolutionaries. Two, each were not only religious, but also political heretics. Although at this point, we surely not yet understood Joyce. It is simply impossible, genuinely, to read joys apart from celebration. And this is a very deeply Catholic celebration, but nevertheless, a radically profane celebration. Perhaps Joyce's are our only truly modern text which can be read with such celebration today. And if Joyce is our most popular modern canonical author, Joyce, beyond all other modern authors, has transformed our canon. This truly canonical language can only be a wholly new language today. Here, no one is truly an absolute no one. An absolute novum reflecting and embodying a new eon. A new apocalypse, which is apocalypse itself. And thereby a recovery of a long lost Christian apocalypse. Yet nevertheless, this is a new apocalypse, which is apocalypse itself. And if Joyce is our most apocalyptic 20th century writer, there his language can be understood as a rebirth of biblical apocalyptic language. And therefore a rebirth of the language of Jesus itself. Our forgetting of that language is a forgetting of the revolution of Jesus. But that language has been reborn again and again in our history. 
and if it has truly been reborn in Joyce's epic language, this is perhaps the only real hope left to us. My pleasure to uh, introduce uh, this commentator, uh, Adam Kotzko, uh, who teaches, uh, who, who's a local boy, I think. Are you, are you from Chicago? Yeah. Teaches at uh, uh, Professor of Theology, Professor of Theology at Scheimer College in Bay, and a graduate of uh, Chicago Theological Seminary. His BA is from uh, Olivet Nazarene, and MA and PhD from uh, Chicago Theological. I. Uh, first came in contact with Adam through an absolutely brilliant book that uh, he wrote on uh, Zizek, Zizek and theology. And uh, those of you who uh, have a taste for adventure and like, like to know more about Zizek, who uh, is a very eccentric, uh, interesting, amazing creation all by himself, um, there is no better way to start. I think than with Adam's book. This, that's, as, that's as good an entry as you're going to find. It's clear, it's crisp, it raises the right questions at the end, and it, I think some of the things you say at the very end you know, almost forecast the direction that uh, Zizek would take after the book was published with Zizek's own explorations of, the, of, of uh, uh, Christianity and uh, this uh, Hegel, strange uh, Hegelian life. Lacanian uh, thing that Zizek is doing. Um, uh, in addition to that book, uh, Adam is going on to do a great deal more work. He's a very, very uh, productive uh, writer who has been doing a series of uh, valuable translations of the work of Giorgio Agamemnon uh, and um, has been doing. Uh, if, if we've been, if we've been uh, getting a lot of saturated phenomena in the last couple of days, uh, I think Adam is interested in uh, not saturated phenomena, but weird phenomena. <laughs> <laughs> so he's written a book on, uh, uh, in 2015 on creepiness and uh, another on awkwardness. So he's exploring some, uh, not, not saturated phenomena, but para phenomena of uh, great, great interest. So please uh, welcome uh, our commentator, Adam Kosky. sadly also one of our most dismissed and ignored. What Altizer's paper today highlights is that he is above all the most literary of theologians. Uh, after leaving Emory University, he spent most of his career in the English department of uh, SUNY Stony Brook. And he once told me that if he is a critical scholar of anything, it is of the poetry of Blake. Uh, this may seem like a strange trajectory for a theologian, but for Altizer, it's a natural fit because as he emphasizes again and again in the paper that we just heard, he believes that literature, much more than the institutional church or traditional academic theology, literature is where the most radical theology is happening. Indeed, where scripture is still being written even today. Um, in case we are tempted to view this claim as somehow figurative, he clarifies in his conclusion that the deepest goals of Christian theology are fully actualized in Dante, Milton, and Blake. 
Dante and Milton can offer us an apocalyptic vision that challenges and even overwrites that of the Bible so that people now read the opening chapters of Genesis as though uh, they were written by Milton. Joyce does them one better, as Altizer attributes to him the kind of transformative power over the English language that one is accustomed to attribute to the King James Bible. I have questions about this literary actualization of Christianity, and I would like to get at them by means of a short detour into another prophetic apocalyptic religious tradition. In the conclusion to his magisterial three-volume history, The Venture of Islam, uh, Marshall G. Hodgson makes a claim reminiscent of Altizer's. Writing in the late 60s, um, Hodgson holds out the hope that even if Islam begins to wither away as a living religious tradition, its vision, its challenge, can continue to resonate in the contemporary world via a literary afterlife. Drawing on Hodgson's work in the wake of the Iranian Revolution, Norman O. Brown takes a deeply Altazarian step further, claiming that the only way we can grasp the apocalyptic rhetoric of the Quran is by reading it as we would Fenegan's Wake. I find Brown's suggestion to be an interesting and fruitful one for the study of the Quran, and yet it strikes me as perhaps less helpful for understanding the Iranian Revolution, um, much less the various uh, resurgences of Islam that have uh, occurred continually since then. If we are to imagine an Islamic Joyce intent on actualizing the Islamic vision in literary form, it's difficult to picture them as anything other than exiles, as Joyce was, and as Altizer has effectively been in the theological community. And any claim to have actualized a more authentic Islam is likely to ring hollow in the face of other, more forceful actualizations in the political field. Of course, Altizer is not thinking on such small timescales. Dante, after all, has far overshadowed any of the more immediately influential politicians and clerics of his time, just as Milton's poetic vision has endured, whereas the radical theology of the Puritan Revolution, which Altizer has elsewhere highlighted, languages in obscurity. Perhaps Joyce, too, will outlast any preacher, politician, or pope of our era through his profound impact on the English language itself. This long view does conflict with contemporary academic demands that every concept and argument will somehow have an immediate political payoff, a demand that is unrealistic and increasingly tiresome, at least to me. Altizer's mismatch with academic fashion here may be a welcome breath of fresh air. Even if Altizer is not political in a reductive sense, however, his narrative is one of rivalry and conflict played out over millennia as the Christian epic vies with classical epic and Hebrew saga for supremacy, an effort that is ultimately successful in Altizer's view, at least in terms of the Hebrew Bible. Much less emphasis is placed on classical epic, a choice that is puzzling to me because that is, after all, what Christian epic is most directly imitating. Um, as a professor at a great book school, um, a theologian in exile, perhaps, I have spent a great deal of time with the classical epics, and I am intrigued by the resources Altizer provides for rereading the epic tradition. Um, as he highlights, the epic is a puzzling genre, one that perhaps not even Aristotle got quite right. Favoring tragedy, he claimed effectively that the epic wants to be a tragedy, but is forced to expand its story beyond all reasonable bounds via the proliferation of episodes. Perhaps it is only the perspective of Christian epic that allows us to see what the classical epics were really trying, and arguably failing, to do. To tell a story that can include all stories. To provide a sense of meaning in history, even to justify the ways of, God, of the gods to man. On this latter point, one thinks of Homer's very Miltonian Zeus complaining at the opening of the Odyssey that humanity constantly blames its problems on the gods. The problem is finding a big enough frame to house the epic ambition. The Greek epics seem to give us only a cycle of cities rebuilt and conquered, of joys that, uh, of journeys home that open out into further journeys. The Roman epics have a more teleological feel as both the Aeneid and the Metamorphoses culminate in the founding of Rome, but this frame threatens to reduce them to propaganda for a local and provisional victory. 
only the Christian narrative is big enough to fulfill the epic longing for completion. And so one can say that Milton fulfills the tradition with Paradise Lost, which relates literally the entire history of the world. Milton is not content to outdo the classical epics. Um, he wants to undo them, to expose them as imposters. It has long been a cliche that the devil is the hero of Paradise Lost, but I think it is worth taking that claim very literally. He does everything the epic hero does, rally the troop, go on dangerous voyages, make skillful use of deception, and succeed against overwhelming odds. Milton does not make the devil the hero by accident, but as part of a rhetorical strategy to expose the classical epic hero as evil, as no hero at all. From this perspective, Blake's claim that Milton is of the devil's party is ultimately a claim that the devil remains seductive, indicating that the classical epics perhaps maintain their own autonomous force even in the wake of the Christian epic. It is, after all, the classical epic that gives form to Joyce's epic of everyday life, Ulysses. If the Christian epic was able to effectively overwrite the Hebrew Bible and more ambiguously overcome the classical epic, it has proved less mighty in the face of another potential rival, namely the New Testament, or more precisely, the Gospels. Altizer does say that the Christian epic reactivates the vision of the book of Revelation, just as Heidegger can reactivate Paul. Yet does anyone effectively rewrite a new gospel? Milton tries, perhaps, but Paradise Regained is a historical footnote that is far from reshaping our understanding of the temptation in the wilderness. Perhaps the New Testament is the unsurpassable horizon. Certainly not even Milton has so thoroughly rewritten the Hebrew Bible as the New Testament did when it cast its predecessor as the Old Testament. In the end, of course, every response to a conference paper is little more than an invitation for the original speaker to respond. I have cut in line for the Q&A. Um, I hope this brief presentation is taken as an extended series of questions about the literary actualization of Christianity and other more concrete attempts at actualization, about the relationship between Christian epic and classical epic, and about the place of the New Testament and specifically the Gospels and the narrative of world historical rivalries that Professor Altizer has laid out to us. Thank you.